All right, our third talk is from Judy Kim, uh, now at Yale University. I guess I'll also talk while this is setting up. Um, does no, I don't. Um, oh, sorry, I'm gonna actually do presenter mode. Just wanted to mention that I'm like totally in awe at everyone else's talk, um, so I'm really honored to be getting this award um, and really excited to share this uh, work I did at Johns Hopkins with um, my advisor, Marina Bedney. So we learn about the world through a variety of different ways. We can, for example, use vision to see that bananas are yellow and long, or someone might tell you actually some bananas are purple. We can also just learn by thinking. You could infer, for example, that yellow and purple bananas are different species of bananas. And in certain societies like ours, we additionally learn through formal education. The fact that there are so many different ways of learning that are all usually at play, um, it makes it really hard to answer this fundamental question of how do we know what we know? Where does any piece of your knowledge really come from? And so the approach that I took um, in my dissertation was to ask, well, what does someone who doesn't have access to one of these sources, say a type of perceptual experience, know about the world? Specifically, what do people who are born blind know about things that are typically seen with vision? So empiricists like Locke um, famously argued that all knowledge has to be built up from sensory experience, and therefore he predicted a blind person would have really limited knowledge about things like light or color. Locke said you could, of course, try to explain to a blind person how light works using words, but words are just sounds, and words can only take you so far. So if you were to say um, light involves particles hitting the eye to a blind person, that would sound just as nonsensical and incoherent as if you had said there's a company of little tennis balls that fairies strike with brackets against people. Um, that's an actual Locke quote. Um, that's the kind of limited understanding you would um, end up with if you don't have the relevant perceptual experience. And variations of empiricism emphasizing the primacy of perception in knowledge acquisition kind of persists in modern psychology and, um, and philosophy in different versions. And the key question that I wanted to explore was not just what do or don't blind individuals know, but what really is the nature of knowledge acquired without visual experiences about vision. And another kind of way of asking that question is, what's the nature of knowledge you can learn about things we typically see with vision only using non-visual means, like through language and inference? So do blind people really only have shallow, fragmented, incoherent word associations like Locke thought, or is it possible that much deeper, structured, and coherent understandings about vision can be acquired even without it? And prior work on this um, question had been somewhat limited um, in number and given mixed answers. And so to ask um, these questions, I compared what um, congenitally blind and sighted people know for all kinds of different knowledge. Um, and in a way, the most challenging and exciting um, task of this work involved thinking about, well, what does it really mean to have shallow or deep knowledge about vision? And in fact, what do sighted people really understand about vision? And so a side point I'm kind of going to make um, throughout is that there might be a whole set of rich knowledge we all have about what we see, um, and as a field, we've only kind of um, scratched the surface on them. But before I jump into all that, here's a bit of background on um, our participants. Um, we always recruit congenitally blind individuals, um, so they've been blind since birth. Um, they're screened, so they have no prior experience with things like shape, color, or motion. Um, and we always have age and education match um, control sighted participants. This is information from one study, but it's very representative of um, all our participants. Um, and our, most of my data actually were, um, was collected at this National Federation of the Blind Convention, so they generously let us come back every year. Um, and thousands of blind individuals gather here, and they socialize, listen to talks, uh, have meetings, kind of like what we're doing here. Um, and they return it year after year, um, so we've really gotten to know some of our participants really well. Um, and this photo model, Lindsay Azzolino, um, is actually also one of our collaborators um, who's provided a ton of advice on everything from methods, uh, research questions, um, and actually she personally has really shaped how I um, thought about my dissertation work. 
So diving in, um, we started first with what's very frequently studied in vision, so knowledge of what things look like, like um, objects' color, shape, and texture. Um, and this is joint work with my cohort and lab mate, um, Julia Ellie. And we focused on knowledge about the appearance of animals because animals are commonly known and they have pretty stable features. Um, and most of the ones that we picked, importantly, don't, we don't have much tactile access to. You know, we don't go around touching um, uh, the shapes of hippos or lions. So to cut to the chase, one of our first findings that was really striking was that blind individuals don't consistently acquire really simple verbalizable knowledge, like knowing just that polar bears are white. Um, so here I'm just showing you results where people sorted cards with animals written on them with braille or in print based on shape, texture, and color similarity. Um, for shape, we find that blind and sighted groups um, sort uh, pretty similarly, and um, the same is true for skin texture. But the groups are really different for sorting animals by color, where blind participants are giving answers that are not only inconsistent with what sighted people say, but inconsistent with each other within the group. And we've kind of replicated this finding um, a couple times. And um, another finding was that this couldn't be explained by how easily um, sighted people describe these dimensions um, because they actually uh, are most efficient and consistent at describing color compared to shape and texture. So at this point, if we thought Locke was right, we would have stopped here um, and I would have had a very different dissertation, right? So according to this idea that knowledge builds up from experience to more complex concepts, the fact that blind individuals don't even memorize really simple things like polar bears are white would suggest that they might not know anything else. Um, but luckily, I just, we decided to continue and ask and said, has anyone actually asked blind, what blind people understand about color? But then what would that even mean? Um, and for this next study, we took inspiration for developmental literature, where we know that even young kids know about deep causes of what objects look like, like the natural kinds or the way they are because of some essence, whereas for man-made artifacts, it's things like their function. And we decided to start asking, do people have intuitive theories of color in particular? And then, of course, do you need perceptual experience of color to have that? And this is how we went about testing the, um, this, these questions. We reasoned, well, if someone knows that the color of natural kinds like strawberries are caused by things like their DNA, then they can predict that two instances of strawberries are likely to be the same color, even if you don't know that strawberries are typically red. Likewise, if you know that many artifacts colors are dependent on kind of random factors like personal preferences, you could predict two cars are likely to be different colors, even if you've never seen a car before. Um, and these theories could become very specific where you know that actually for some artifacts, um, colors are tied to their function, like stop signs, their function is to be visible and recognized. And so you could predict here um, that they would have consistent color. So um, this is to describe our main experiment in the study. We set up this island explorer scenario where people are told they're encountering um, new objects and plants and artifacts on this um, uh, with the Zorka people. And here's an example um, trial where we say you tag alongside uh, miners into a cave. There's a green gem that's spiky the size of a hand. It's vibrating in place. Um, it's called an Enli. How likely is that the next time you see another Enli, it's also going to be green? And this novel object design is important because we can then test in both blind and sighted people predictions about color consistency that are based on kind of having an abstract model of causes rather than through any prior experience with these objects. And so the example I just gave was about a natural kind. Um, and for that, sighted people said, yeah, that gem, uh, it's pr pretty likely to be the same color next time I see it. We also had artifacts like um, this gadget that floats around the house spraying an odorless chemical that's yellow. Um, and sighted people said that's likely, less likely to have the same color every time. But then for something like a red square coin that's um, cool to the touch and it's their main currency, um, sighted people replied that's likely to be the same color. Um, and it's actually interesting in itself um, because not many people have studied what sighted people um, know about color, and this shows that they might have such a thing as um, an intuitive theory of color. But more, uh, most importantly, blind individuals' responses were identical to the sighted, suggesting they too have models of why objects um, have the color they do and can make predictions based on it. 
So another way um, of framing these results then is that blind individuals are in fact more likely to acquire the deeper structured knowledge that support inferences and the generation of new knowledge rather than shallow, easily verbalizable knowledge, let alone the other way around. And so to really drive this home, I love this, uh, this is my favorite example, we asked also people to just give free response explanations of why do you think this is the col uh, color of this thing. Sighted people for polar bears typically said they're white because of the Arctic environment, they have to blend in. A lot of our blind participants actually said they're black, and this is one sample explanation they gave. Black because it has to do with the climate, again, and dark colors absorb heat. Um, and in fact, both answers are true. Uh, polar bears actually have black skin, scientists study this, um, underneath their white fur to preserve heat. And so really the theory kind of knowledge can exist separately from any experiential knowledge. An important question this raises then is how are such um, theories acquired? Um, one possible answer that we've um, given before is that perhaps blind people, um, based on their experience of shape um, of objects through touch, uh, know that animal shape can be predicted by things like uh, their kind, like animal kind. And then they might infer, well, maybe color that w works that way too. Um, and so we find evidence that um, they might be using such an analogy across senses, and that might be a possible starting place for intuitive theories of color. But another really important question, of course, is what is the role of um, language? And I mentioned before that it seems like blind people aren't simply just memorizing everything sighted people say. Um, and so instead, we think that they're making really sophisticated inferences about how sighted people talk about color. And so that's kind of one thing um, I've been exploring in these other studies. For example, we're asking, do people understand pragmatically why we say things like polar bears are white or that bananas are yellow? And you might be thinking, well, that's obvious because they are white or because they are yellow. Um, and that's actually not totally true. It's a big philosophical puzzle in color metaphysics uh, where philosophers argue that there's no one intrinsic color to an object because what it looks like actually totally depends on the light source, who's looking at it, what their color system is like, uh, what part you're looking at. And so one object can be so many different colors that there's no such thing as a true objective color. And so um, the proposal, oh, this is, yeah, a pigeon that <laughs> looks really bright to, if you have pigeon vision. <laughs> um, so one thing that's been argued is that we just pragmatically say that objects are a color just as a default heuristic, but we're actually meaning things like a banana is typically yellow to people with typical color vision under typical viewing conditions. And a study that's now being conducted by a wonderful um, undergrad in the lab, Zaida McClinton, we've been finding that blind and sighted people both understand all this. They have models for why a color is perceived that way and that it's dependent on things like a viewer or the lighting, and then flexibly and pragmatically reason about what's appropriate to describe to other people. And in this final, final study, um, I think I'm over time, we've looked at also how people understand how we use color words to mark the uh, perceptual color space and kind of similar to the theme that I've been um, talking about, on the one hand, we find that there are group differences when you look at really shallow kinds of knowledge. So we've actually replicated this classic Roger Shepard finding that blind people are more in, slightly more inconsistent in their knowledge of precisely which pairs of colors are similar, like that um, blue and purple are, but different from red. But we also find that groups look really similar when you probe knowledge like, do you know that one blue can actually be bluer than another blue? Do you actually know that a purple, even if it's called purple, could also be kind of blue? Um, but red, because it's on the opposite end of a color spectrum, it can't be called blue. Um, and so, and to cut to the chase again, um, that's in fact what we find blind and sighted people under totally understand um, similar things about the color space. And so to wrap up, um, across all studies, we're finding um, that the nature of blind individuals' knowledge um, is that they have rich theory-like understanding that structure how they think and talk about color. And of course, this is also expanding our knowledge of what sighted people know about visual experience, which is also that it's um, rich and theory-like. And this opens up so many questions we have yet to answer, um, and I've only briefly suggested some potential mechanisms. Um, so how is this knowledge acquired without vision, right? But then how is this knowledge acquired with vision? What's the role of language? How do kids learn this in development? How does AI acquire the kinds of knowledge that I've talked about today? Um, and in fact, to that point, I think one of the most important questions from this is, 
uh, points that I want to make is that even for something as perceptual and low level seeming as color, humans have really rich understandings and make inferences about why things are the way they are. Um, and we should really continue to think about how we achieve what's more akin to, I think, philosophers often called understanding rather than just knowing something. Um, and the result from my findings, um, I think, constrain how we can go about answering these questions, um, namely that people don't just memorize things, but make inferences about what people mean, but also perhaps that language is more likely to teach us knowledge of why things are rather than just shallow facts about how things are. So with that, a um, ton of people to thank, um, but uh, especially my advisor, Marina Bedney, uh, Julia Lindsay, and then Barbara Landau, and um, Johns Hopkins PBS, um, who I miss dearly, and all of these wonderful undergraduates. Thank you. Hey, Darko. Hey, Judy. Great talk. Mm. That was lovely. Um, I'm curious, uh, maybe give you a chance to talk about some of the stuff from the second and third part of your talk. One interesting thing about color naming of artifacts, of course, is that many artifacts are multi-part, but the way the colors that we use to describe them are like a blue bike does not have blue wheels, right? So subparts of artifacts have interesting distributions about what are we labeling when we are labeling specific artifacts as having colors? And I'm curious if any of your work has explored that, whether any of these intuitive theories apply in that situation, and also if the intuitions on which subparts are the same for sighted versus congenitally blind individuals. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about it specifically about artifacts, but we do actually have unpublished data um, where we asked people, actually, yeah, how the color consistency, but across parts, I just remember that we have that data. Um, and a lot of blind individuals actually kind of, uh, like, totally overgeneralized from texture. So they'll say, like, a coin. I know that, like, the ridge and the numbers are so tiny that it's, like, really hard for me to tell apart um, using touch. And so I bet, like, sighted, for sighted people to see that, they also have to so like a coin's gonna be really colorful because you have to mark all the different colors. They say things like a wedding dress, like I feel like it has different parts, they're all gonna be different colors. Um, and yeah, so there's like some really weird, surprising things about how we do use color that um, blind people actually have different intuitions about too. Yeah, thanks for the question. Hey, Judy. Hi. Hi, um, thanks for a really lovely talk. I wanted to um, ask you some follow-up questions exactly about the open questions you talked about at the end, like the role of um, acquisition and the role of language. Um, and particularly um, what something I learned from doing field work in Kenya is that actually like in that culture, um, parents don't feel like color is like a relevant concept to teach kids. And kids there actually don't learn color words until they, um, enter formal schooling. And so that actually kind of seems like the opposite um, of your blind population, right? Where you have this population of kids who have access to perception but don't have the language. So I was wondering if you could speculate a bit about like um, how exactly um, the theory of vision and color develops and like the interaction of the mechanisms underlying that. Yeah, I actually think it is important to separate like or acknowledge also that like we're looking at pretty sophisticated theories in adults. And so like when we look in development, I think um, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot less, I predict variability um, that's uh, dependent on experience because even within our participants, we actually do find like motivation and interest in color. Like a lot of blind kids are sometimes like, I wanna know about color and other kids are like, why do I have to, like, why do I have to even do this task? This is really annoying. Um, and But then I think uh, initially it's going to be uh, acquired using really basic mechanisms like I've mentioned, like it could be analogy from a different sense, which would be very crude. And so it would eventually have to be like more refined through education and like cultural knowledge. Um, we talk a lot about like the role of generics language. If you hear once that a strawberry, when someone says strawberries are red, maybe that's like already a one shot clue to learning that all natural kinds are like all whatever is are going to be um, the same color? That's a great question. 
Um, sighted people can uh, easily associate uh, color terms with noises, uh, and they do it consistently. Sorry, w what with noises? Uh, color terms. Oh, color terms, okay. And uh, they do it consistently. Some of those are also in language, like white noise, but um, these are, can be consistent for things that are not necessarily are, are linguistic. So I was wondering whether this would be a way to learn about color terms in blind people. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's like related to the mechanism I suggested that you could use, try to like map between different senses and learn through that. Um, I think, again, the answer would be like to some extent you could, but then there are points at which they separate so much that um, you can't learn about color anymore. Um, and so it would be a matter of um, figuring out like what parts are unique, like what, like is there anything unique about color that you can learn through that? And I would predict that you can't. Um, there's a limit to that. Thank you. Uh, the fourth talk.